I'm Linda Hirsch, and this is EdCast, a program created and produced by educators for everyone interested in education. Americans have long looked to higher education as a means of solving some of the nation's biggest challenges, including disparities in wealth and income and political divides. With increasing student debt and low retention and completion rates, college may not be living up to its promises. My guest today, Professor Stephen Mintz, maintains that colleges must adapt and change. Today on EdCast, we will examine not only what it means to be educated, but also specific ways of creating a more engaging learning environment that ready students for personal, academic, and career success. Coming up now on EdCast. <music> Joining me today is Stephen Mintz, a prize-winning author and expert on the history, politics, and future of higher education. He is a pioneer in the application of new technologies to teaching and scholarly research. Stephen Mintz has held positions at a number of leading universities and is now a professor of history at the University of Texas at Austin. He was the founding director of the University of Texas Systems Institute for Transformational Learning. He was a visiting scholar at Harvard, a fellow at Stanford, and a senior advisor to the president of Hunter College. Stephen Mintz is the author and editor of 16 books. The latest is The Learning Centered University. Thank you so much for joining us today on EdCast. It's really a delight <laughs> to be here. Thank I want to say at the outset that The Learning Centered University is a highly readable book and contains so much valuable information that I know will only scratch the surface of it today, but I really want to talk about the many ideas that you have in this book. So let me start. One of the things you observe in the book is that there are a lot of books written today about higher education. I mean, so it seems to be in the news and seems to be on everybody's mind. What are the challenges that are facing higher education today? The challenges are obvious, I think, to everyone who thinks about the subject. There is the affordability crisis that we're facing right now as we have to figure out how to translate college for all into a reality with many students burdened with very high levels of debt. But the real problems, I think, are much deeper. There's a business model challenge for many of our universities. There's a learning challenge. There's a completion challenge. There's an equity challenge. And above all, there's a political challenge. That is, there's a growing number of Americans, including young people, who are no longer convinced that college is a good bet. So that's a good point to stop for one second. So this notion of what they call return on investment, is college, in your mind, a good bet? And why? There is no question if you go to a well-resourced, highly selective institution that it is a perfect bet. One of our challenges here in CUNY and elsewhere is that when only about 60% of students graduate, that is first-time, full-time students graduate, then it is not irrational for some students to wonder whether this really is a good bet. And then there's another problem. Even among those students who graduate, 40% wind up in a job that didn't require their major. Or they flail and flounder for years, often living in their parents' basement, before they fall into a job that may or may not require their training. Now you mentioned in the book that the demographics of our students today are very different and that of course that the economy and the workplace have changed. Tell us a little bit about what those changes are from perhaps when I was in college. The new student majority consists of commuting students, it consists of working adults, it consists of family caregivers, it consists of English language learners, it consists of international students, the diversity of our students is astounding because we've embraced the idea of college for all, which is truly a democratic idea. We have to make it work. This brings us to the Learning Centered University and your idea that universities really have to transform and really have to adapt. 
And the title, The Learning Center University, is something I really want to go into for a moment. What does it mean to be a Learning Center University? And then what would it look like? You and I know what a great educational experience looks like. It is a dialogue between a faculty member and students. But that is often not what we're providing our students. I myself have taught 40,000 students in face-to-face -face classes, generally at 400 to 600 students at a time. The students that I know best are the students, I'm afraid, who plagiarized because I have to deal with them <laughs> face to face. But the other students, I do not have much of a dialogue with, unfortunately. We need to figure out ways to make that experience much more personal, much more interactive, much more mentored, and much more supportive. We can do that. So what would be, I know that you talk about pedagogical practices in the book, and you, met, you speak, um, since our audience is not all educators, I always like to go back and kind of talk about some of the concepts. And you are a big proponent of what we call active learning. And tell us a little bit about what that is exactly, what that looks like in a classroom, and are we seeing that on, I know we're seeing that in CUNY, but are we seeing that on most campuses today, do you think? Most of our classes consist of one of two forms. They're either lecture classes or they're discussion classes. What we've discovered is that even in the discussion classes, it is typical for an instructor to speak 80% of the time. In other words, it is not truly an interactive, open dialogue in which the students are actively participating. We know that students learn most when they process the material. What I'm calling for is for professors to think of themselves as learning architects whose job it is, is to design activities that truly engage the students with the course material. Do you think most faculty see themselves in that way? Absolutely not. <laughs> So Faculty it... members are not formally trained in instruction. We all learn both by trial and error and by observing those who came before us. What would it take, do you think, for faculty to take on all these different roles that you're advocating for them? Everyone who goes into teaching does it because they care about students. And I'm of the view that if we help our faculty to better understand how students learn, then we have taken the first step towards providing the kind of education that will be most impactful on our students. Now, there, of course, are differences between what are our scholarly research universities and our community colleges where teaching is more prioritized and I would say even valued. But what do you think, wouldn't this mean a major overhaul in how we view the role of the university itself in terms of emphasizing teaching rather than research and scholarship? A source of great concern to me is that much, especially of the lower division part of the curriculum, is repetitious of high school. My students had U.S. history in fifth grade, eighth grade, and eleventh grade. And while I can tell better stories and do more analysis than, though, than many of the preceding teachers, the fact is that the course is pretty similar. Now, if I was going to make that class much more meaningful to my students, first of all, it would be much more comparative. I have incredibly diverse students. They want to see their heritage represented in the curriculum. Secondly, they want a course that is more relevant and meaningful, that addresses important issues. Just to take two examples. Do assassinations change the course of history? Does terrorism work? Those are the kind of big questions that my students are 
genuinely interested in. Now you're also wandering into the whole idea of what we teach on campuses and some of the resistance that we see to higher education, even, I hate to say it, even looking at other cultures. And I mean, we have a state that doesn't want to teach the truth about slavery, I mean, in this country. So what do you think the university, and there are students, I don't have to tell you now, who protest on every side of the political spectrum. How does the faculty member handle that, do you think? And how should we handle that? The advantage of college professors is that they really are subject matter experts. And therefore, if more focus was placed on teaching, people would come up with creative alternatives. Let me give you one example. Franklin Roosevelt's uh, maternal grandfather was involved in the China trade, including the sale of opium in China. Now, whether Franklin Roosevelt understood that or not is not clear. But if I want to engage many of my students, that background, that history is very relevant to them. And this would be a way to internationalizing the U.S. history course in a way that doesn't deviate from what I need to teach but shows the larger significance of what I'm talking about. I think that's wonderful and also gives them a much greater access point to what you're talking about. Now, the thing you say in the book also is that you advocate for more skills-focused education. Um, what are the skills that you're thinking of when you're thinking about that? You and I know what we expect a college graduate to know. They should be financially literate. They should have statistical literacy. After all, we're living in an increasingly analytic, quantitative society. They need international perspective. And they should understand the frontiers of science and the theories and methods of the social sciences. Now, do they really come away with that? I would say that the answer is somewhat mixed because what we offer often are discipline-specific introductory courses. Students, in my judgment, need different kinds of courses that are somewhat more interdisciplinary than the smorgasbord of classes that we currently offer. I know you've, I've heard you say in your talk at host of us that, um, you know, anthropology, intro to anthropology, intro to sociology, poli-sci, that just taking one of those really isn't sufficient. Now my question, I even had that question as you were speaking, um, do our students need a template of some prior knowledge if they are going to look at things in a more comprehensive interdisciplinary way? Facts are a foundation. There is no question that background knowledge is essential to learning. Critical thinking can only occur after students have mastered a certain set of skills and a certain set of knowledge. And so that is absolutely central. So I am very much a proponent of outcomes-oriented learning. That is to think very seriously about what I want my students to know and what I want them to be able to do. And then I design my class around that. So the, the other big component now of education, of course, is technology. So I know you say in the book that some of it has been overhyped and you give some of your own examples of how, you know, you were disappointed perhaps. But what do you see that tech technology can bring to this vision that you have of the Learning Centered University? The key to learning is to process the subject matter. So if you want students to read well, have them collaboratively annotate the readings. It's very straightforward. If you want them to understand causality or relationships, have them visualize the material. Teach them how to present their material in a variety of ways, not just the essay, 
but also digital storytelling and podcasts and presentations. Again, we need to think outside the boxes that we typically operate in. And technology provides us with a tool. I know you say in the book that it should not be a substitute for the teacher. And I know that I, I guess I think that some of us are concerned that um, it's probably less expensive in the long run. Do you think that we're moving toward using technology as a replacement for the conventional or the face-to-face -face instruction that we've been doing? And should we, is that important, the face-to-face? -face? I mean, online degrees are getting more and more popular. There is a trend nationwide towards asynchronous online courses. These are courses that students pursue on their own time. And the problem with that is that it lacks the regular substantive interaction with a faculty member and with classmates that I am convinced is essential to learning. But there's another way to use technology. In association with a group of students, we created some simulations. One simulation modeled on Flight Simulator is you are Christopher Columbus and you are going to sail to the New World and back using current wind and ocean currents. And what students discover is you can't sa sail directly west or directly east because you have to follow the currents. Another simulation gives every one of my students a small graveyard in Cape Cod in the 18th century. And students then learn about life expectancy. They learn about naming patterns. And as a result, they really confront firsthand that the world was a very different place. A world where if you reach the age of 20, you lived pretty long but that half the population was dead by the age of 15. It was a world where men outlived women because of the dangers of childbirth. So your students then were able to use technology to broaden their understanding of some really key concepts. What do you see as the role of AI? Which is, you know, some of us worry that why bother ever giving another writing assignment? Is it ever going to be written by a student? But you, in the book, you say that we shouldn't turn away. What's your feeling? You know, artificial intelligence can be a danger or it can be an incredible opportunity. When I want to illustrate a topic in class, for example, surrealism, I had ChatGPT create a surrealistic image right before the student's eyes and then we analyzed it. So that was helpful. With student essays, they will learn that if they put it into an AI text generator, it will offer a critique of what they wrote. This is astounding. I make it clear that my students have to submit what AI told them. And then I expect them to build upon that, to create something that is superior to what AI could do. And so far, the students have been happy to do that. That's a fantastic use of AI. You are also a very strong advocate for student writing, for improving student writing and ways of doing that. And that's part of, I think, of what you talk about in the book as well. Uh, so this leads me into the humanities, the sad state of the humanities today, which means a lot to me. Uh, humanities seem to be in peril. Enrollment is declining. What's your feeling about can we reverse that trend? Is it important to reverse that trend? Where do the humanities stand today in, in your mind? There is a great classicist named Daniel Mendelssohn who said, that when your father dies, your accounting degree will not help you process the experience. And I'm afraid he's true. 
students in their lives are going to deal with a series of big issues, grief, loss, love, and more. And the humanities need to help them deal with just those issues. Now my fear is that that's not usually what we teach. We teach masterworks of literature, we teach history, we teach the history of philosophy, we teach masterworks of art and music, and that's wonderful. But we need to remember what the humanities are really about, which is they're about ethics, they're about identity, they're about coming to terms with the deepest emotions that we feel. So what would the humanities be teaching then in, in that vision? In history, we would be teaching about how human beings have gone through a kind of cognitive revolution. That is that their ideas of ethics, their experience of family life, of parenthood, of war, have changed dramatically over time. I'm really interested in the human dimension, the existential dimension of history, and I want my students to learn about that. But if we're teaching literature, I want them to confront these similar issues in the works that they're reading, that they should be thinking, what am I learning about friendship? What am I learning about marriage? What am I learning about parent-child relationships and the like? Now, I don't have to tell you, you already know that students are concerned they're not enrolling in humanities majors because they're worried that uh, financially they're not feasible per, uh, majors for them. Do you have any, I know you also talk about the applied humanities, which I thought was very interesting. We don't, we're running out of some time, but if you could tell us a little bit about how you see us addressing some of those concerns that students have that if I major in the humanities, you know, I'm not going to have a job. When I was at the University of Texas system, we were opening a new university in South Texas, which is among the poor parts of the United States and very medically underserved. So we created what we called middle school to medical school, a pathway into all of the health sciences. And here's the way we designed it. Your English class was narratives of pain and illness. And your history class was the history of public health and medicine. And your art history class was representations of the body. And your sociology class was the sociology of medicine and health. And your economics class was health economics and your math class was health informatics. Your physics classes and chemistry classes were also oriented towards health issues. In other words, we had an opportunity to think outside the box and really try to create a humanities, social science, and science curriculum that would be deeply meaningful to these students. I'm convinced that What's when you become a doctor, right. you need to be a well-rounded person. You need to understand human psychology just as much as you need to understand the body. So you're also really advocating for the humanities being integrated into STEM. Exactly, I mean, that in seems this to me case. Exactly what you're saying is that take, because I agree with you, what a doctor has to make ethical decisions every day, who's gonna live, who's gonna die, and you know, allocating resources. So that's one role I, 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 of the humanities of being integrated with STEM. You also mentioned in the book that the humanities should pay a little bit more attention to career preparation. How could they do that without you know, being totally career obsessed? Well, in addition to the medical humanities, there are the business humanities, the finance humanities, and other humanities. And then there are special areas where I think there are huge opportunities in the future. 
documentary filmmaking is going to be crucial in the future. Developing museum exhibits is crucial. Thinking about the relationship between human-centered design and technology is going to be a wonderful area in the future. Thinking about analytics from a humanistic perspective can be a really wonderful career possibility. Many of my students only imagine a small number of jobs. They can become a doctor and a nurse. They can become an engineer. They, know. they can become an architect. We need to help them understand the world is bigger than they can imagine in their philosophy. College should do that. If nothing else, college should do that. We've alluded to this earlier, but I want to go back to it. There have been alternative models presented for education. Uh, you talk about uh, pushing general education into high school completely, uh, getting more students directly into the workforce, uh, more online courses. I've read about the apprentice model, where you took at the community colleges not as a transfer institution at all, but simply as an apprenticeship opportunity. And you say that there are limitations to that view of education. Tell us why you think those are limited. That form of education is narrow, and it's shallow, and there's nothing wrong with a vocational orientation, but let's not confuse that with a liberal education, an education that introduces you to the cutting edge of every topic that a student will address in their adulthood. And we need to distinguish between that and the kind of education which is being pushed because it's cheaper to provide. College for all should mean all students have the same opportunity for education that I had. That is America's democratic promise. That, that is such a wonderful ending that I think I'm going to stop right there because there's nothing else to add to that. That is really terrific. Stephen Mintz, thank you so much for joining us today. The book is The Learning Centered University. As I said, it's readable and it's full of wonderful ideas and we only scratch the surface of it. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for inviting me. That's it for this edition of EdCast. Thanks for watching and see you next time. like to hear from you, please send your thoughts and comments to cunyedcast at gmail.com.